So the next module is on fuel systems, and there is a lot of material to cover there on fuel systems. Um, but the, the main sticking point or the heart of it really is the carburetor. The carburetor, the carburetor is what mixes the, the, the air going into the engine with, with the fuel, right? And if the carburetor doesn't give us the right mixture of air and fuel, the engine's not going to run. And by and large, when you have a small engine problem, a good 70% of the time, it's related to a carburetor problem. The passages inside these carburetors are really small. As the fuel sits in there, it starts to go bad and break down and the passages get clogged. And the vast majority of your small engines that are not running correctly, really it's, it's not a compression issue or an issue with spark plugs. It's usually an issue with the carburetor. So with that, um, we'll jump into these different carburetor systems. A carburetor could have all six of these systems that you see on the, on the screen. And I'm trying to get my cursor up here. Let's see if I, okay, there we go. And we'll change that to maybe a dark blue. All right. So, um, So a carburetor could have these six systems in it. And um, these six systems are float, idle, main metering, power pump, and choke. And that would be the case of an advanced small engine carburetor or a carburetor like this one that you might see on a, on a muscle car or a hot rod or something. Now, does that mean that every carburetor on a small engine is gonna use all six of those systems? No, oftentimes, they'll you only use three or four of the systems um, and sometimes even less. Um, so we're gonna go through each system and I'll tell you which ones are the most important and, and how they work and, um, and, and how to troubleshoot them. So with that, let's, let's jump in. Okay, so every fuel system, whether it's uh, carbureted or electronically fuel injected, has to do these three things that you see on the screen. It's got a meter, atomize, and distribute the fuel with the incoming air going into the engine. So metering means it's got to mix the right amount of fuel with the right amount of air entering the engine. Atomize means, just like you see on the, on the um, slide, it means that you have to break up the fuel into fine droplets to spray in with the incoming air. And then it's got to distribute that atomized spray with the incoming airstream into the engine. And that's, that's, those last two are really, really important. If I can get my annotation tool up here again, um, this atomizing and distributing in that fuel only burns as a vapor. It doesn't burn as a liquid. So by breaking the fuel up into little droplets, atomizing it, it helps get that fuel ready to be turned into a vapor or vaporized so that it can be burned. And of course you want an even mixture going inside the engine with, that, with, with spots that aren't running richer or leaner than others. Now I used a, um, I used a term uh, richer and leaner and that refers to uh, metering, how much fuel you're giving the engine. And so metering, if I'm giving the engine a lot of fuel, that's running rich. If I'm giving the engine just a little tiny bit of fuel, or another way to look at it, if it's getting a lot more air, then that's running too lean. So lean is not enough fuel, rich is too much fuel. Okay, lean is not enough fuel, rich is too much fuel. And ideally, somewhere around 14 or 15 to one here would be our ideal mixture. So if I get my annotation tool up there and I, that 15 to one air fuel mixture, I'm 
making it green there because that's your ideal air fuel mixture for a gasoline engine. Um, now, is that the right air fuel mixture for our small engines? No, they tend to run just a little bit richer. We tend to give them just a little bit more fuel because they're air cooled. And believe it or not, that fuel actually helps the engine cool. So we tend to run somewhere around 13 to maybe 14 to run one. Um, if you've ever spilled some gasoline on your hand and, and you, you probably felt that, hey, my hands feel cold, right? That's the fuel evaporating away. That same principle takes place inside the engine. And so by running it a little bit richer, giving it a little bit more fuel, it helps maintain the engine temperature um, and keep it from, from running away. So an air-cooled engine, you, you're going to run a little richer than uh, a liquid-cooled engine. Your passenger car, your gasoline passenger car, by the way, though, it would be running right here, 14.7 to 1, 15 to 1, it would be running right on that, on that best mixture line. So again, um, rich, right? Too rich is, is way down over here. I'm giving it too much fuel and too lean will be, I'm not giving it enough fuel. Now, the danger by running it too lean, not giving enough fuel is I, I could actually burn up the engine, um, especially if it's a two stroke. Because remember in a two stroke engine, we mix the fuel, I'm sorry, we mix the oil with the fuel. So if we're running low on fuel, right, a lean mixture, we're also giving it less lubrication. All right, um, we'll go to the next slide here. So distributing the air fuel mixture, this image is off of an automotive engine, so it's got multiple cylinders that the carburetor is feeding. With a small engine where we're typically only feeding a single cylinder, it's not as big of a deal, but you can see that Distributing the air fuel mixture evenly uh, to all the cylinders is really important as if you had a multiple cylinder engine, you wouldn't want some running richer than other ones. Here's another shot of that. Um, let's get to the parts of the carburetor. And I know it's when you look at a carburetor from the outside, well, one, carburetors on the outside can look quite a bit differently and they don't look like necessarily what's on the screen but those parts are in a typical carburetor. So things like a Venturi area, the float, a main metering jet, the throttle assembly, those things are inside a real carburetor. So if we uh, start with the first carburetor system, that's called the float system. Now the float system uh, is named that because inside of it, it, it does just have that. It's got a little float mechanism inside there um, where you have a little uh, float pontoon that actually floats on top of the fuel. So here I have this fuel from the float bowl. Now, how does the fuel get into the float bowl? Well, for instance, this little bottom part of the carburetor, this little bowl area, that's the float bowl down there. Okay, so how does the fuel get down into the float bowl? Well, it would come from my fuel tank. So you can see this fitting right here. This fitting right here, fuel goes from the fuel tank. From this, this is a motorcycle carburetor, so it would just go from gravity. Gravity would cause the fuel to come down out of the tank and down into that fitting. Now that fitting there is right here. So the fuel tries to get in the float bowl. What restricts it? Well, there's this needle and seat device here. That's a restriction point. So when there's no fuel in the carburetor, the float pontoon, which works just like a little boat in there floating on the fuel, it sinks down to the bottom. So it sinks down here to the bottom. And so now the, the needle is away from the seat and that allows fuel to then enter from the gas tank, past the needle and seat and start filling up 
the float bowl. So this float bowl area is almost like a little temporary storage area for fuel inside the carburetor. Um, so the float starts filling up full of fuel. The little float pontoon then floats up to the surface. It gets to its stop here. And what that does is that pinches the needle into the seat and that pinches off the fuel flow. Once the engine starts running and fuel starts to exit the bowl and go from the float bowl down into the engine, the, the fuel level will drop, the float will then drop down, it will bring the needle off the seat and more fuel can then enter the float bowl of the carburetor. Now this particular carburetor that I'm holding up here, notice that it has a, a hose coming off, that's a float bowl vent or not a vent, a volt, float bowl vein, a drain. So I could, um, I could unscrew that screw and drain all the fuel out of the float bowl when I was done riding the, the dirt bike that this carburetor went to. And that would keep the carburetor nice and clean. It would keep fuel from going bad inside the float bowl. The most common thing that people do is they, they you know, run their motorcycle, their lawnmower, their whatever, and they shut it off and they think, oh, I'll, I'll use it again. And then they don't use it. And the fuel sits in this little bowl and it starts going bad. And as it goes bad, it starts to harden and, and basically turn almost into a varnish. And that clogs up all the passages inside the carburetor. So by draining the float bowl, you're going to prevent that fuel from going bad inside your carburetor and you'd save yourself a lot of headache. So the float system, is it an important system? Yes, the float system is very important. Um, in that the float system affects all the other systems of the carburetor. Let me give you an example. If the float was adjusted too low, so right there and it was pinching off the fuel flow. If it was adjusted too low, it wouldn't keep enough fuel in the float bowl and the engine would then run too lean. And as we discussed, that could burn up an engine. Likewise, let's say that the actual float, maybe it developed a leak, which is known to happen. It develops a leak and that float sinks right to the bottom of the float bowl. Now there's nothing to control the, the fuel, so it just keeps filling up more and more and more and more. And so now the engine's going to run way too rich. In fact, it can even run so rich where it starts overflowing outside of the carburetor onto the ground. So the float can impact all the other systems of the carburetor and its level that set will affect the air fuel mixture that the engine runs with. So yes, the float is a pretty darn important system inside the carburetor. All right, moving right along. So the next system from the float that logically makes sense to talk about next would be the idle system. What is idle? Well, if the engine is running, but it's not running really fast, it's running at idle. Now, if I were to put some speeds on here, I would say, okay, well, if an engine is running at, let's say 2,500 to you know, 3,000 revolutions per minute or more. So that engine's running pretty fast and it's probably beyond the idle system. Now, revolutions per minute of what? Of the crankshaft. So that crankshaft spinning around in the engine, if it's, if it's moving two to 3,000 revolutions per minute or, or faster, we're, we're having enough air enter the engine. We're probably off the idle system. But if we're spinning slower than that, we're likely using the idle system and pulling fuel from the idle system to feed the engine. So how does, how does the fuel get from the float bowl to the engine? Well, remember, fuel enters the fuel inlet, right? Coming from the fuel tank, goes past the needle and seat, it ends up hanging out in this temporary storage area for fuel we call the float bowl. 
from there, the fuel is going to go through typically the main metering jet or a pilot jet, and it's going to go into the idle tube. From there, it gets picked up and it passes this idle air bleed. Now, this is important because as air enters the engine, we want to start mixing the air with the fuel. Remember, we talked about atomizing the fuel into tiny little droplets. So that air is going into the engine and it starts to mix here with the fuel and that helps break the fuel up into little droplets. From there, that atomized air fuel mixture, it goes below the throttle plate and into the incoming airstream. So the thing about the idle circuit it's made so even if you're not working the throttle. So if I, if I take my blower I have right here. Now on a blower engine, right, I, I work the throttle manually. But if I let go of the throttle, I don't want the engine to die. I want it to keep running. That's called idle. I want it to idle there, right? So it's running on the idle circuit. As I squeeze the trigger, as I squeeze the trigger, what I'm doing is I'm opening up this throttle valve. So I squeeze the trigger, the throttle moves from closed to open, I'll make that a different color. It moves from closed to open, that allows a bunch of air to now go in the engine. And of course the car reader's job is to mix the right amount of fuel with that air going into the engine, right? But for idle, my fingers off the trigger. If it had a slide valve on it, you could say that it's, it's on the turtle position, right? It's on the slow position. So in that case then, the throttle is closed like you see in the picture here. So what happens is the fuel goes through the idle port passages. The fuel goes through the idle port passages below the throttle plate and that's how it gets into the engine. And again, we're going to mix a little bit of air with it to help atomize the fuel as it goes into the engine. Okay. So idle circuits pretty important. In fact, when the idle circuits, they're the smallest passages inside the carburetor. When they tend to clog up, that's when you end up with an engine that doesn't run really good and it hesitates and you can give it throttle and it stays going, right? You're giving it a throttle, it's going, and then you let go and it wants to die. Um, that's usually because the idle circuit is clogged. Now, some engines will have an idle mixture screw that they've drawn right here, where we can loosen or tighten this screw to control how much fuel flows through the idle circuit and ultimately control the air-fuel mixture, right? The, whether it's running rich or lean, at idle due to that, uh, turning that idle mixture screw. On most carburetors, if I turn the uh, idle mixture screw, if I turn that screw in, so I turn it clockwise, it screws the screw into that passageway, pinching off fuel flow, thereby leaning out the engine. All right, let's clear all those drawings out of there. And we'll get, okay. So from the idle system, if we started to slide that speed control over to the, to the rabbit, right? We started asking the engine to run faster. Or if we had a hand control here, we started to squeeze the trigger, right? We're opening up the throttle. Well, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna have some off idle uh, ports come into play to help smooth out the transition from, from idle to main metering. So what you'll notice here is that the throttle is open. So I have a, a large amount of air entering the engine and now what the fuel does is it goes from the float bowl past the main metering jet 
into another little passageway we're going to call the main well, but it's going to go through through the main metering jet. Then it's going to go up a pickup tube and then be discharged from the main nozzle right in the center of the carburetor where it can then mix evenly with the air entering the engine. Now notice that there's another air bleed here to help help us mix the air with the fuel. So that's important there uh, to help atomize that fuel as it's entering the engine. And also notice that now the fuel is being discharged above the throttle plate and it mixes well with the incoming air. So this is our main metering system. This is the system that the carburetor is probably on most of the time because you're running the engine at higher speeds asking it to do more work. So that means it needs to bring in more air and mix more fuel with that air entering the engine. So that's the main metering system. Now, how does this main metering system work? Why does it do what it's doing? Well, it functions off of the Venturi principle. Now the Venturi principle is, um, is pretty unique in that it's the same air principle that creates lift for airplanes, allowing them to get off the ground. It creates downforce in like Formula One race cars. Um, basically, to, to make it uh, super simple, however much air, oops, I don't want to do that, however much air I have going into the carburetor here at the top, I have to have that same air coming out. So you notice that there's this restriction inside the center of the carburetor. That restriction is called the Venturi. And if I, are, if I take that Venturi and I just outline this piece of it like here, what you'll see, and, I, and I'm gonna redraw it, I'm gonna draw it right here. What you'll see is it kind of looks like an airplane wing, right? In fact, we have those on both sides of the carburetor. This particular carburetor has then what they're calling a boost venturi in there, where it's got other little wings. But basically what we're doing is we're necking down the carburetor. And what I like to say is the air entering your engine through the carburetor, it's smarter than we are, right? Because if we're on the freeway, oops, I didn't, air. If we're on the freeway um, and we're seeing that, hey, I got, uh, let's see, I got one, two, three, four, five arrows there. I got five lanes on the freeway and all of a sudden I'm going from five lanes down to three what happens? It's a big traffic jam. Everybody slows down. It's chaos, right? The air is smarter than us. It doesn't do that. What the air go says is, hey, I'm, I'm going from five lanes down to three. Everybody floor it. Get on the gas and go as fast as possible. That's what the air actually does. It speeds up as it goes through this narrow venturi area of the carburetor because However much air is entering at the top, that's how much air has to be coming out the bottom. So the airflow speeds up dramatically as it passes that narrow area inside the carburetor. Because the air speeds up, the pressure inside this venturi area of the carburetor, the pressure inside this area drops. So I'm going to write low, low pressure. So the airflow speeds up and the pressure drops. Wow, that, that, was, that was terrible. I apologize, but uh, next time I'll use the text tool. Um, same thing happens if this is my um, airplane. So here's the front of the plane. 
There's the window there. There's the tail. All right, you get the idea, right? Here's the airplane wing. Um, the airflow hits the wing. This has to go the long way around, so it goes up and over and down. And this airflow just goes along the bottom. So what happens is this airflow going up and over the wing has to speed up. Hence, it makes a low pressure above the airplane wing and that creates lift, right? That's what gets the plane to lift off the ground as the plane goes faster and faster. The air going over the top of the wing goes faster and faster. The pressure gets lower and lower until it elevates the plane off the ground. So this Venturi principle is what makes the metering system work because we make a low pressure in the center of the carburetor, that low pressure then is so low that it causes the fuel, which is under outside pressure out here, it's got this air bleed, it's at atmospheric pressure. By the way, what's, what's atmospheric pressure? Well, at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is about 15 pounds square inch, or PS, I is what that's supposed to say. Well, there's not 15 PSI inside the center of the carburetor anymore. There might be 10 PSI, 11 PSI. So because the pressure over here is greater than the pressure in there, inside the center of the carburetor, that causes the fuel to go through, from the float bowl, through the main jet, and be discharged out of the main discharge nozzle into the incoming airstream. So it's this Venturi principle that makes the main metering system work. The Venturi makes the main metering system work. Pretty, pretty darn neat. Um, uh, by the way, if you, uh, I don't know, if you wanted to make a, a race car with downforce, you just take that wing, you flip it upside down, right? And then that pulls the race car to the ground, right? So we can, we use this Venturi uh, principle all over the place. Inside our carburetor, we use it to meter the right amount of fuel with the right amount of air entering the engine. So that's our main metering system using using the Venturi in the center of the carburetor. Okay, so a small engine carburetor typically is gonna have a float system. It's gonna have a main metering system and it's gonna need a way to help you get it started. So that means it's usually gonna have also a choke system. Now that choke system could be really, really mechanical. You could control it. For instance, on this blower engine that I have sitting here, I have a lever at the top, right? And I can flip that lever back and forth. And what am I doing? I'm moving the choke valve. So that lever closes a valve at the top of the carburetor. Well, what's the deal with that? When the engine is cold, it doesn't do a good job vaporizing the fuel. Remember that fuel will only burn as a vapor. I'm gonna type this in. Fuel only as a vapor. Now you're probably thinking, now wait a minute. Uh, I was, uh, you know, maybe I liked pyrotechnics as a kid and I spilled some gas and I lit it on fire on my garage floor, which would not be recommended, but I usually have a student that says that they did that and they think it, it didn't seem like it was liquid on the ground and I lit it on fire. What you lit on fire was the vapor coming off of that liquid fuel that's just, you know, fractions of a millimeter above the surface of the liquid fuel. As the fuel began to burn, of course, it made a lot of heat that vaporized the rest of the fuel and then you ended up burning all the fuel on your floor. So fuel only burns as a vapor. So what that means is, is it takes some heat to help us vaporize 
takes some heat to help us vaporize the fuel. Well, when the engine's cold, hey, there's no heat there yet, right? So how do I compensate? How do I compensate for a cold engine? Cold engine, give it a lot of fuel. We're just gonna give it a heck of a lot more fuel. That's how we compensate. So the choke valve, what it does is it pinches off the airflow here. It closes the top of the carburetor, effectively pinching off the airflow so that now air has a much harder time trying to get into the engine and only a little bit of air gets through. That also causes a lot more fuel to be drawn out of the float bowl and discharged out of your idle circuits, out of your main metering circuits. And so what do we do? By pinching off the airflow, guess what? We're giving it a lot of fuel or we're making it run a lot richer. Now, once we get the engine started up, it starts running. Of course, the engine starts to make heat and what do we do? We notice the engine starts running bad and then we have to start turning off the choke. Well, in passenger cars and some of your kind of high-end small engines, they might have an automatic choke that has a little coil spring here in the bottom. And this coil spring senses the temperature of the engine and mechanically opens the choke as the engine heats up. But most small engines, especially those that you hold in your hands, right? Like a chainsaw or a string trimmer, we're gonna manually control the choke with our fingers by moving a little lever, which closes the choke valve. And the engine starts running poorly because now it's running way too rich as it heats up. And so what do we have to do? We have to turn the choke off. So that's what's going on with the, with the choke. Now you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute. What about on that engine you're holding up it's got that little bulb that you squeeze that squirts some fuel. That, that primer bulb there does, does just that. It, it, it helps draw some fuel from the tank, get it up into the carburetor, primes the carburetor circuits in that it gets the carburetor circuits loaded full of fuel so that they're, they're full of fuel and ready to deliver the fuel on demand. It might even then help squirt a little bit of fuel in the engine and that's gonna help us from having to pull start the engine so much, right? A car engine, it's got an electric starter to crank it over, so that's not as big of a deal, but if you actually have driven a carbureted car engine, you would usually get in there and pump the gas a couple of times. That would squirt some fuel in the engine and it would help set the choke. So same, same concept. So a small engine, um, a, a carburetor on, on a small engine. What circuits is it likely to have? Well, it's definitely going to have a float system. It's gonna have a float. It's gonna have a main metering system. It's gonna have some type of choke, even if that choke's mechanical. It's gonna at least have those three systems. Most small engine carburetors will also have an idle system or idle circuit inside the carburetor to get the engine to run well at lower speeds, okay? So those four systems, float, idle, main metering, and choke, are what you're likely to find on your typical small engine. And that's what, if you watch the Bridge and Stratton videos, that's what they're gonna focus on is those four systems because that's what their carburetors would have. However, if you have a, a more advanced carburetor, like in this drawing right here off of a car, or maybe something off of a motorcycle, well, you're likely to have these other two systems. So we'll, we'll go into these other two here uh, really quickly. Um, like I said, a more advanced carburetor would likely have these other systems. The, the power system and the accelerator pump system. 
So with that, let's scroll down to some of those systems. How about the power system? Well, remember we, we've been talking quite a bit about metering, right? And we said, hey, um, when you give the engine more fuel, it runs rich. When you give the engine less fuel, it's gonna run lean. Oops. Right. Switch dummy. So lean is less fuel or not enough fuel and rich is maybe too much fuel. Those are my two extremes. Well, if my concern is making maximum power, like I'm not concerned about a uh, good fuel economy or even emissions, smog, I'm, I'm just concerned about making power. If that's my number one concern, what you will find is that running a little bit on the rich side is gonna help you make more power. So the power system is there to do, do just that. It's there to make the engine run a little richer or give it a little bit more fuel when you're putting the pedal to the metal. So on a more sophisticated carburetor, a, a car carburetor, for instance, it might have a power valve for like to, like to use power valves. And the idea is that when the um, vacuum created by the engine drops because you go to wide open throttle, look at the throttle blades all the way open. This little spring causes this power piston to open up. And then that's another passageway for fuel to get into the engine. So it opens up an additional passageway for fuel to then be discharged out the main metering system. So another way that you could do this is you could have a metering rod that comes out of the jet. But basically what you're trying to do is to get more fuel to enter the, the engine by giving it extra extra passages or extra extra ability to get into the main metering system. So that would be your power system. Well, what about your pump system? Well, your pump system is just that it's a mechanical pump. Now you would see this mostly on bigger engines um that the carburetor sitting further away from the engine there's more distance there and what happens is if i quickly open up the throttle well the air the air goes in the engine very quickly boom the air flies in it right because air is very light the fuel it's a little heavier right so it's going to lag behind so what happens on a bigger engine that has more space between the carburetor and where the, where the piston and combustion chamber is, um, if you quickly open the throttle, the mixture is going to go lean because the air is gonna rush its way in there and the fuel is gonna be trailing behind. So to prevent that from happening, we'll use an accelerator pump. That's just that, it's a mechanical pump. It's connected to throttle linkage and it physically pumps a plunger through here and actually squirts fuel down in, through the throat of the carburetor as you work the throttle linkage. So as you're working the linkage, it actually be pumping fuel a little tiny bit, but it'd be pumping fuel into the engine. So that's the accelerator pump system. On a small engine, you might see that on like a motorcycle carburetor for like a bigger displacement motorcycle. And it's what makes it accelerate really snappy and accelerate well, like boom, boom, when you open the throttle. Without that, the engine's gonna hesitate a little bit. It's gonna go dun, 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 because it's not getting that fuel and it runs a little bit lean for a split second because the air enters the engine faster than the fuel, okay? So that would be the pump system. Like I said, you would only tend to see that on a more performance-minded engine uh, that was a little bit bigger. So something like a, like a larger displacement, maybe 250 to 500 cc or more, 
displacement motorcycle engine that has a little bit more distance between the carburetor and, and the actual combustion chamber. So you don't want it to run lean and you want a really crisp throttle. All right. So with that, we have now covered, I do that every time. Uh, with that, we have now covered all six of these carburetor systems, float, idle, main metering. We just did the power system and the pump system. And of course, there's also the choke system. So float, idle, main metering, power, pump, and choke. Every carburetor, whether it's this Holly carburetor here, it's the carburetor on your uh, small engine, it's gonna have some of those systems on it, okay? Something like that Holly would have all those systems on it. And then it kind of multiplies everything by four because this, this happens to be a four barrel carburetor. So there's four passages built into this one carburetor to let air into the engine and to be mixed with fuel. It's almost like having four carburetors in one. It's a four barrel carburetor. And you, you might see that on, on carburetors for cars, you might have a, a one barrel carburetor, two barrel carburetor, a little bit more performance, or four barrel carburetor, even, even more performance. Um, all right, so that's all fine and well, but what about some of our small engine carburetors? Well, uh, you might see some weird carburetor designs on small engines. They still have to use those systems, but the thing is, is a small engine is not a very expensive engine. So the engineers look at these carburetors and they think, well, how cheap and simple can I make this thing and still have the systems and still do its job, right? And so that makes some of these carburetors look kind of weird. Like this is an image of a, of a Briggs & Stratton vacuum jet that's got like an auto choke valve on it. You can see the, the uh, coil spring right there. Um, this would be an example of uh, a more modern small engine carburetor where it's got an idle system with an idle mixture screw. It's got an idle speed screw. Here's your throttle valve, your choke lever. So this carburetor is going to have float, idle, may metering, and choke, okay? So that's your typical small engine um, carburetor. Now, it looks a little different. It's not a downdraft. All these other pictures, this was a downdraft carburetor, right? The, the airflow went down through the carburetor on its way into the engine, which is very typical for automotive carburetors. But for small engine carburetors, it's actually more common to draw the air in from the side. So they're what you would call a side draft carburetor, where the air is going to come in, it's going to go through an air filter going through the side. Here's my float bowl down here. It'll pick up that fuel from the float bowl and deliver it into the engine. And so if we look at this carburetor right here, this is a side draft carburetor, right? Air enters through the air filter. It goes through the side of the carburetor, picks up fuel from the float bowl, delivers it into the engine. All right, we'll clear those out. Now, inside this carburetor, the same things we, we talked about, right? You see it, there's the float, there's the um, main jet air bleed, the main metering systems there. I still have a throttle valve, still have idle circuits. Um, this carburetor has an adjustable main jet on the bottom and it's got a, like a screw that you can turn there to adjust the air fuel mixture for the main metering system. And it's got another screw to adjust the idle mixture. Um, you tend not to see this style as much because it gives you adjustments. And um, I mean, that's led to some vapor lock issues, Briggs and Stratton says, but I look at it this way, if, if an in if, if people find screws on something, you know what they're going to want to do? They're going to want to turn those screws. And if I were to turn this screw, that would affect my air fuel mixture. Now, one thing I didn't say, um, but we did talk about rich and, um, rich and lean. If I make the engine run rich, 
it's going to make a lot more exhaust emission. I'm going to write smog there. So um, if I adjust this carburetor up too rich, not only can that like dilute the oil with fuel and it's going to make the engine run a lot richer and um, that's going to make a lot more exhaust emissions. So about the time they started putting emissions regulations on small engines, you started to see them get rid of adjustable main metering jets. Um, and I think, you know, there, there's reason to that so that you couldn't mess up those mixtures too, too bad. Now, um, here would be a shot of that carburetor with that adjustable uh, main metering jet. And again, if you screwed it in, it would lean it out. If you unscrewed it, it would richen it up. Um, here's one with a fixed, uh, fixed jet, and you got a couple different shots of that. Here's one with the needle valve. So there's, there's all kinds of different variations uh, here with small engines. Again, it's usually that they're trying to make the carburetor get the job done, but be pretty simple in operation and cheap to produce, right? So you'll see some different configurations. And we're not necessarily concerned with all-out performance or drivability because the engine's not changing speed that much. Um, it's not like we're, we're driving it in a car and it's towing our boat or it's, we're, we're hot riding it from stoplight to stoplight it has to run more of a fixed speed so it, it can get away with being a little bit simpler. Um, so with that, what I'm gonna do is close my annotation tools. I'm going to close this um, close that um, that guy and now now I can see the chat a little bit um, so how do you clean out the idle tube if it's really small like how do you how do you get these things cleaned out well that is a great question all right so this is an ultrasonic cleaner if you really wanted to get a carburetor clean uh, you could just drop the whole thing in an ultrasonic cleaner and that would do a great job of cleaning it out. Um, and they actually have little ultrasonic cleaners at Harbor Freight Tools that do a pretty decent, do a pretty decent job. But that being said, well, what, what could I do if I didn't have that ultrasonic cleaner? How could I um, clean this guy out manually? Well, you could take a, a bottle of carburetor cleaner. Oops, Let's see if I can get that going inside the carburetor. So I, I took off the air filter and if I look down the throat of the carburetor, you can see there's little holes. Remember that those holes go to little air bleeds that help mix air with the fuel, right? So if I take my can of carburetor cleaner and I put that little red straw on there, and I squirt the carburetor cleaner down these little passageways, oftentimes that will help loosen up that fuel that's all clogged in there. The other thing I could do is I could take out my idle mixture screw. So on this carburetor here, and a lot of it is kind of learning the lay of the, lay of the land, like learning, well, what do I have? For, for a carburetor and what where, where are different parts. This is my idle mixture screw. So if I were to take that screw all the way out, I could then take the can of carburetor cleaner, put it in there and spray around and spray out the inside. Um, that being said, when stuff's really clogged up, I'm gonna have to just take the whole thing apart, take out these two screws, take the float bowl off, take the whole thing, put it in a, in a parts washer or spray the whole thing out with with carburetor cleaner or brake cleaner works really well. Um, and that will help me get all those passageways clean. Um, sometimes though, you might encounter a carburetor that's so clogged up that no matter how much cleaning you do, you can't get all the passages cleaned again and you end up having just to replace the whole carburetor. 
And sometimes, quite frankly, you might be working on an engine that the carburetor is so inexpensive that a new carburetor is only 15 bucks. It's not worth your time to clean off the old one. So you might just replace it. So it really just depends. Um, the thing that I found that works really, really good though, is these ultrasonic cleaners. And they just, they, you, you fill them with soapy water. You could put a mixture of simple green in there. Um, and you can throw the whole carburetor in the in the cleaner and it will buzz it at a high frequency and that really helps loosen the crud out of all the small passages. Um, so hopefully that answered that uh, question. Um, let me switch cameras. Um, so good question. Let me go back to um, the chat. Let's see. No, it should be here. Exit full screen. How about, there we go. Okay. Um, all right. So, any other questions there related to carburetors? We're going to spend next week talking about carburetors and fuel systems as well. I wanted to talk about the carburetors tonight though, because um, as you watch like the Briggs and Stratton videos, you know, I, I wanted to hopefully fill in those gaps. There is a lot more to um, fuel systems, like this presentation here, if I put the screen share back on. There we go. Nice. If I put the screen share back on here, um, this this uh, this presentation is in your uh, Canvas web page, and it's got all kinds of stuff here related to the fuel system that's beyond just the carburetor. I mean, does it have carburetor stuff on there? Yeah, it sure it sure does. Um, but there's there's other stuff to it. So we'll we'll be talking about carburetors more next week and we'll also look at, at, at the whole fuel delivery system everything from maybe there's a um you have kind of a unique carburetor like this is a pulsa jet that you would have on like a older briggs and stratton lawnmower engine or maybe you have something that's that's pretty advanced that has a fuel pump um on it and find a picture or like how do the primer systems work anyways we'll, we'll spend time on all those other um, parts of the fuel system and then transition into into governors um, so with that I just wanted to give you guys uh, a little bit of opportunity to answer to ask any more questions I'll um, stop the screen share now that I figured out where the stop button was um, all right, so um, let's see. If we have questions about example carburetors, um, yeah, you, you, can, you can ask me whatever. Even if, um, if, if you have a carburetor and you're like, man, I, this thing looks totally different than the carburetor you were, you were showing us, what's going on? Take a picture of that carburetor, send it to me, um, and I can help you identify what it is all the carburetors are gonna have, you know, those six, six systems on them at maximum, right? Float, idle, main metering, power, pump, and choke. That's all they can have on there. Um, most small engine carburetors are only gonna have four. They're only gonna have the float, possibly the idle system, the main metering system, and the choke. And some of them look, look kind of weird um, but if you think about like it has to have those systems on there and uh, what it's trying to do after a while it starts to make sense where where stuff is at so if you have questions identifying your carburetor um, by all means take pictures of it send me those pictures you can email them to me or something like that um, I'd be happy to to work with you um, I think the carburetor section is a great section because Honest speaking, most of the problems that you'll find with small engines relate to
carburetor issues, mostly clogged up carburetors, getting those carburetors all cleaned out. Um, you know, why do we focus on uh, the compression stuff first? Well, because, you know, I want you to know how the engine works. And remember, if the engine doesn't have compression, I don't care how good the carburetor is, it's not going to run, right? And if the engine doesn't have compression, that's going to be the most expensive thing to fix. In fact, that might be just get a whole new engine. Um, but fortunately speaking, usually it's not engines having not, not having compression. It's usually clogged up carburetor passages that cause us to, to have a lot of headaches on, on our small equipment. So, um, so with that, if, uh, if you guys, uh, do you guys have any last, uh, last questions? Okay, well, I will. Oh, I have a question, not a question, but I was just curious yeah, go ahead. for the, um, because we're online this semester, what if we had like a discussion um, place where we could post our pictures and then if you answered our questions, other people might be able to learn from it. That is a great idea. I'll tell you what, I got my notepad here. <laughs> I'm going to, I'll set up a discussion board. Yeah, I'll set up a discussion board so, so we can do just that. And okay. I'll get it started. I'll, I'll post some, um, some carburetor pictures myself uh, going on some different things uh, to show you guys. That's a great, great idea, uh, Elizabeth. So thank, thank you for that. I'll get that going. Um, <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, everybody, thank you for uh, joining me online and, and uh, suffering through my technical difficulties here. Um, but I'm glad we got to go through some carburation stuff. If at this point now you watch the Briggs and Stratton module three uh, videos, um, hopefully it will make a little bit more sense. They have some nice computer animations, but um, you know, you, you, you'll have a little bit more background under your belt before starting those videos. All right, again, look for that discussion board and uh, send me those questions and I'll, I'll do my best to get them answered for you. Okay, oh, everybody, have a good night. Okay, have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.